the way it all came about is in like, you know, the middle of winter, I was watching videos about fishing for golden trout in the Sierra. The golden trout's like a total unique species. They like evolved in the Sierra and they're like these brilliant colors. Like they're, they look almost tropical. They're like bright reds and like yellows and they just look amazing. And I had no real plans to do anything this year, was planning on being home, focusing on the website, focusing on, you know, work essentially. Yeah, you kind of like, you were like, oh, I'm not going to do too much this year. I guess the trail was calling to me in a way, like, you know, these long, crazy through hikes are like pretty addictive. And then the next thing you know, you're fucking, you're like, you know what, I think I do want to hike this year. And I texted Sonic uh, and I was like, guys, we should go, we should go to the Sierras. I want to like go catch some, some fish out in the Sierras. And then instantly Sonic was like, oh yeah, we should do this like route. They like strung together all these high routes and they like did that, we should do that. And I was like, yeah, I just want to fish. Like, let's do it. Our plan was to connect three off-trail high routes in the Sierra Nevada mountains of California. First up would be Andrew Skirker's Kings Canyon High Basin route. Then we'll hike the High Sierra Trail to connect to the Wilson Dixon Southern Sierra High Route before tackling Steve Roper's Sierra High Route, the original cross-country route in the area. There's no support vehicle, it's just us three carrying all our equipment and at least five days of food. We'll have satellite beacons, but we can only use them in absolute emergencies. When our food runs out, we'll hike down into a valley and hitchhike into the nearest town to buy more food, charge our devices and take a shower before hitchhiking back up to the same place and continuing on. All three of us have hiked thousands of miles on America's Triple Crown Trails, but with this trip, we wanted to get away from the crowds and hike through the 99% of the Sierra that doesn't have established trails. The majority of the time, we will have no trail to follow and we'll be navigating using GPS waypoints and maps. We'll be hiking over 400 miles in roughly four weeks, tackling class three scrambles, never ending talus fields, snow traverses and rushing rivers. The majority of the time we'll be hiking at elevations well above 10,000 feet. We're living at sea level, like the sea is like right there. We're immediately going up to like 10,000 feet. So we're going from zero feet to 10,000. That's going to be interesting. It was also a massive snow year. Thankfully we are going really late in the season, so most of it will probably be melted away. And hopefully the rivers have, and stream crossings have calmed down. I definitely have things in the back of my mind that I'm like very aware of and um, a little bit apprehensive for. We'll be getting up to like 13,000 feet a couple of times on the trip, so altitude sickness could be an issue. A snow traversing kind of intimidates me because I haven't done that much of it. I think that's a big part of wanting to do trips like this is to like tackle your fears and kind of get over them. I met Cheesebeard a third of the way into my Appalachian Trail through hike in 2015, and we hiked the rest of the way together. Then in 2016, he through hiked the Pacific Crest Trail while I was living in my adopted home of Finland. We met up later in 2016 and did some traveling in Asia and some hiking in Nepal. He then came to check out Finland and he met Erica, who would go on to become his girlfriend. Then in 2017, we through hiked the Continental Divide Trail together, which is when we first met Sonic. He then decided he was also going to move to Finland and give things a go with Erica. Nowadays with my hiking, the big thing that I really want to do is not necessarily do like the triple crown trails. Like I want to do something that like is less done because the reason I go out there is to kind of like get away from people. I don't want to be like elitist, you know, where it's like oh, people shouldn't go out there. It's just like, I don't know. I want to get out and like kind of get out in the middle of nowhere and not see so many people. You think about the amount of people that are going out on the PCT, for example, now compared to say even just 10 years ago, it's been like an absolute boom in through hiking. Like the AT has had people through hiking it for a long, long time. And we saw the impact of that. Like the AT was a crowded, crowded trail with a lot of negative impacts on it. And the PCT from what I understand is kind of going in that way. Hopefully people know what they're doing and they're like practicing good leave no trace like principles. But the, like even if everyone is, if you have that many people going out and tackling the trails, like it will have an effect. 
I've been like scraping by to save up for this trip. So I've done like nothing. You know, I, I eat cheap food. I don't eat out. I've not been boozing. I like kind of go to work, come home. And like knowing that I'm going to go like hike, you know, go do what I like really love doing is like a big, big relief. And I've like managed to scrape together the money to do this. But just barely, like, I don't have much. <laughs> it's gonna be a cheap one. It's gonna be another gas station burrito trip. Definitely not gonna be living large. So we fly from here to Stockholm, Stockholm to LAX. We gotta buy resupply, bus out to Sierra's, meet up with Sonic. Yeah, hit the trail pretty much like that day after. It's pretty much like boom, boom, boom. Sonic's been you know, taking the lead on like route planning and figuring out our resupplies, how we're gonna do this and how we're gonna do that. And like, she's on it, like she's so well organized that yeah. we've been able to take a little bit of a back seat on the preparation side. She fucking knows it all. I'm just like, ah, yeah. I was just like, I wanna go fishing in the Sierras. And she like had this whole route that she knew about. Had it all plotted out. I just have never been that interested in doing the PCT, but I have been interested in the Sierra and the Cascades. So it made more sense to me to link up, oh my God. Uh, it made more sense to me to link up all the high routes, um, which are gonna be, I think, more spectacular than the PCT, because you're up higher in these super cool basins. Everyone talks about it, like on the PCT, you're like all my friends who've done it, they're like, oh, the Sierra is so great. So I was like, well, it'd be super cool just to do the high routes, done the Wind River high route. I said I wasn't gonna hike uh, after the AT. We we're all just like, this is dumb. I don't wanna do this anymore. But uh, I guess you're a different person after something like that. As much as we like joked about it, we we're like, it's gonna be so life changing. And like, it, I guess it was to an extent. I don't wanna see people day after day necessarily. And I don't wanna like, I don't love through hiker culture and like the kind of entitlement that comes with it and how like I've certainly been that person as well on trail being like, I deserve this because I'm through hiking. And I was like, no, you don't. So like, and I feel like that attitude is very present. Even with my ankle this year, I was like, I have to do it this year because I have people who want to do it. In March, uh, end of March, I broke my fibula and s dislocated and sprained my ankle and had to have lateral ankle reconstruction um, surgery in April. I was just like, skiing and I don't ski a lot. I normally snowboard, um, but it was gonna be a huge powder day the next day. So I was like, all right, I'll practice my skiing today while it's not like super great out. The day was really good. I had fun, didn't fall. When I was breaking before a traverse, that was gonna take me down to work. I, I don't know exactly what happened. My ski went sideways, just the right one. And my left one was still going forward. So I just kind of tumbled forward, broke the fibula and I guess just that broken motion allowed the ankle to sprain inside the boot, which is super rare in ski boots, but you know, that's, uh, I did it. So, <laughs> um, I don't know, it sucked. The doctor was just like rotating my, like just like the super swollen, nasty like ankle. He was just rotating my foot around. It's the most like, one of the most painful things I've ever experienced. I was gonna hike the Grand Enchantment um, with Jet Fighter. I wanted to do a bike rafting trip. I had a 50 mile race in the San Juans, like ultra running. So I had to cancel all those things. Um, I was like really, really upset about that. So I was like, well, I'm not giving up the Sierra. Like I'll do what it takes. I'll go to physical therapy, uh, get it as good as it's gonna get. And then I'm going for it. Um, but then I have my brace and now I have the compression uh, wrap to help. It sucks to be like, okay, I have to go stick my foot in this river for even though it's really buggy out and I don't have a head net because I keep forgetting to order one. Like, <laughs> yeah, I just have to be more cautious and carry more shit to deal with an injury, I guess. Day one of true hiking, we got up pretty early to try and get up and over because we thought there wouldn't be sun directly on us. And that was definitely fake news. 
We were in full blast sun, it was super hot. We dropped down 5,000 feet. Oh yeah, day one we climbed 5,000 feet, just like right off the bat. I mean, you and I were coming from sea level, so I was feeling elevation. I know you were too. Even Sonic said she felt it and she lives in Jackson. So elevation hit us pretty hard the first day. Uh, got up to like, I wanna say it was like close to like 10,000, maybe high nine. Uh, we camped in a really sick spot, actually, that first night, kind of like halfway down a climb. Felt pretty good to like start the adventure. Uh, mosquitoes were miserable there, though. The Kings Canyon High Basin Route is a 125-mile high route that circumnavigates the watershed of the, the Kings Canyon River, so mostly the South Fork and the Middle Fork of the Kings. I started guiding in this area in 2014, and at the time I just was out there trying to find fantastic lines for my groups, so we were just exploring. I would just look at the maps and say, I want to go here, and I'd find a group who was also sort of, who shared that interest. And then over time, it was a couple of years went by, I started realizing that I had pieced together almost accidentally this, this high route through Kings Canyon National Park. And uh, I had done the Sierra High Route, Roper Sierra High Route in 2008. North on the Sierra High Route of Horseshoe Lakes. Buzz Bro, what's your take on this place? Looks good. <laughs> it's big. <laughs> It's, it's bigger big. than you can imagine. I think Buzz just said it right. It's big. And I started saying, well, why can't there be another high route in the High Sierra? Uh, so it took me a little while to sort of build, a kind of de to define the route and pick like what should be like the route uh, versus alternates. Um, and then uh, released the guidebook, I think, in 2015. And then next day, was horrendous. All the like beginning nerves kind of came back, I guess, because we got into the meat and potatoes of that route. We dropped down 5,000 feet and it was a trail, but it was like pretty steep. So that got your knees pretty good. We kind of walked along whatever river that was, crossed over that, which was labeled as like the most intense river crossing that we were gonna have. And that just ended up not being true. Uh, started following up Goddard Creek into Goddard Canyon, but it turns into bushwhack hell. It was just the densest thing I've ever gone through. It was two miles, three quarters, maybe three miles. And it took us like four and a half hours. Sometimes like the brush was so like dense and thick, like it got up above my head. So like over six feet tall, you were pushing through, but it just seemed like futile a lot of the times. So you just fall down and you'd be six feet below, just shrub and like inhaling all this horrible pollen. And it was miserable. The last place in the high sierra that was ever mapped was in Shannon Creek, just in Goddard Creek. We knew we had to be on the other side of the creek, but the creek, because we have a higher snow year, was like rushing and couldn't find a place to cross for forever. We ended up finding a downed log that was pretty sketchy, and we got across on that. And just, man. While I was over there, I jumped over a rattlesnake, apparently. I didn't even know about it. I kind of halfway heard the rattle and jumped and ran, but I, I don't know. Directly after CDT, I moved to Finland to be with my girlfriend. Since then, I've just kind of worked in a bakery. Living in a foreign country, like, at this point, it doesn't really feel weird or different. It's just life now, you know? I've always loved cooking. I've cooked since I was, like, a little kid. And then baking was, like, the final piece in that, where I've become kind of obsessive. I've found, like, what I really want to pursue. Not just, like, as a hobby, but I would like to open a bread bakery. 
at some point. Right now I'm just doing like cake baking, which isn't my cup of tea. It was like a job to get me until I go hike. And then I knew I was going to quit and try to find something better. I triple crowns. I did the AT in 2015. I did the PCT in 2016. I did the CDT in 2017. And then I did the GYT, which we created last year in 2018. And now we're coming out to do the Sierras. And what's your motivation after you've completed something like the triple crowns? It's just because I love it. It's the best way to live. Your day is like wake up, walk, you know, like just absorb what's around you, shoot photography. The simple life, you know, living simply out in the Sierra, fishing every day. Now, I always wanted to get into fly fishing. Like my dad was really into fly fishing, but I had never done it. And like I knew about the Tenkara thing and my friend Waterboy convinced me to buy one. He like very aggressively was like, if I get one, you have to get one. So it's like a Japanese style of fly fishing. So it's a fixed amount of wine. They make them that fold up to about the size of a dollar bill. They weigh, I think mine's like, three ounces, 2.6 ounces, carry flies, fixed amount of wine. It's actually easier to cast than a Western style fly rod. So they say you can learn in about 30 minutes. The philosophy behind it is to like really imitate and learn how to make it look like a true fly. So traditionally Tenkara only uses, I think five different flies. Went up Enchanted. Enchanted was a bitch. It was fucking miserable. It just sucked at first. Like it was hard bushwhacking cross country, kind of similar to the day before, going through just like stuff that clipped out, like going over these horrible brambles. Sat down and had lunch and debated about where we would go. Looking at the topo, it looked to me like we could go up high and then kind of drop down on the backside on what was either going to be cliffs or it was going to be talus. So we rolled the dice because the canyon was completely chock full of snow. It was nothing but a snow bridge and rushing creek with straight cliffs on each side. We decided to go up and over and thankfully rolling those dice, we definitely made the right decision. You got it. Don't even sweat it. From then on, I was a fan of Enchanted. It was pretty beautiful. Ionian Basin was really sick. Chasm Lake was sick. However, I don't think knowing what it was, I still wouldn't do Goddard and Enchanted to get to those views. There are other methods to get you into that area. And I just would never put myself through Goddard again. I've done some pretty gnarly hiking, but this was already one of the hardest things I'd ever done, and it was only day three. I was, I was honestly quite worried. The routes are gonna be hard. There's more vertical gain and loss on a high route, like twice as much vertical gain and loss on a high route per mile as on a standard long distance trail like the Appalachian Trail or Pacific Crest or the Continental Divide. And they're, then they're off trail and all the footing is, or not all the footing, but a lot of the footing is off balance and uneven. High routes are not official routes. Like they're meant to be a tool or a means of some extraordinary wilderness experience. Um, my job as guidebook author is not really to spoon feed the backpacker that experience. Um, uh, there are trails that will do that. Um, I don't think that high routes should. It's always the case, almost always the case that you buy a guidebook um, and it says start here, hike this, finish here. And at least with you know, the high route guides that I've put together, um, sometimes it says start here and finish here, but then other times it says, you know, we'll start at one of these locations and finish at one of these locations and just make sure you do 
this section in the middle. But then even in the middle, even in like that like core root, primary root sections, there are lots of alternates and like you know, bypasses and low roots and extra credit options. And I want there to be like a pick your own adventure element to it. I think that makes it fun, it makes it unique. It goes up this and it's like steeply drops off on both sides. So developing a high root is, it's a huge project. Like I, I think I might be gener like conservative in saying that it's a 200 hour project just for the development of the actual guide. The roots have kind of come to me in different ways. Like with the Kings Canyon High Basin route, I was, I happened to be there, I was guiding trips. I started piecing together these off trail routes that we were doing and sort of said one day like, wow, look, I, we could link all of this up and you could be out here for 125 straight miles without crossing a road. You need to get out in the field and you need to explore all of these different routes and you need to do them forward and backward and you need to do them in June and July and August and September and you need to take clients on them who, don't, who aren't of the same physical ability and you need to really like figure out what like the perfect line is in every single place. And then, you know, then it's a matter of spending a whole lot of time in the office with a Word document and lots of spreadsheets putting it all together. The KCHBR like was so brutal and intense that it kind of put me off. Even three, four days into it, like I was not having the best time. Like I think a lot of us were like kind of stressed out and nervous and like not really sleeping well, not really eating well. There was an underlying sense of stress and anxiety because you were always concerned that the next thing you were going to do was going to be that bad. Growing up in a small, relatively small town on the outskirts of London and then coming into this mountain range and be able to spend like four or five weeks zigging and zagging around in the same mountains, it's kind of overwhelming. And I know that like, you know, you go a certain direction this way or this way over a certain pass and you'll end up in a town or, you know, by a highway. When I look out across this like pristine, beautiful valley, I can look at that and like kind of like have fear. And even though it's beautiful, it's so empty and so raw and so barren. It's just like intense. It's just like an intense place. On the morning of day five, we made our way up and through Ducey Basin and hitchhiked into the small town of Bishop to buy food for the next six days. I was relieved that those first few days of brutal hiking were over and was excited to eat some real food and call Michelle. This trip's realistically gonna be like five or six weeks away from home and it shouldn't be as brutal as being apart for five months, but yeah, it'll be tough and I think she'll be worried about me, kind of understandably so. Like we're gonna be doing some pretty gnarly, you know, gnarly hiking up there and out, out and away from sort of civilization. Me and Michelle got engaged uh, September, I think, September, October 2018. I guess I should really remember the date. She actually proposed to me. I'd kind of build it up in my head of like how I was gonna eventually propose to her. And she just like sprung it on me. And it took the pressure off me to like have to thinking about buying a ring and like how I was gonna do it for her. Now we've been together officially like seven years, but we've known each other for nine. Um, and I moved to Finland seven years ago, so we kind of say that it's like seven years that we've been together, so it's a, long, it's a long time. She's into hiking, but she's not super interested in doing through hiking. She's like, in a way, like way more adventurous and spontaneous than I am, like when it comes to travel. Like she's the one that's been like, hey, maybe we should do like a road trip through Africa. And like, I'm like, whoa, like, when I like kind of made the decision to do the AT in 2015, she was like super supportive. She knew how much it like meant to me to go like try something like that. It's always like really hard to like be apart for such long periods of time. Two people get together and they almost become like one person. They don't have their like own separate hobbies or their separate groups of friends, especially since I moved to Finland. And like I, at first I didn't know anyone here. So I was like quite reliant on her. I think it's so important for like a couple in a relationship to like do their own things and like live their own sort of dreams because otherwise you end up kind of resenting the other person potentially for like holding you back or like limiting things that you've always wanted to do. Like a lot of people our sort of age and like our generation kind of want to do the digital nomad thing, not be tied to like a nine to five. 
What I would really want to do is kind of get into filmmaking. You know, this is what this project kind of is all about. Like, that's where more my passion lies. So not so much like being in front of the camera, but being behind it and like finding cool stories and telling, telling cool stories through a video camera. But I'm kind of torn between the two things. Like, do I get a job that maybe I don't love, but it pays the bills and I don't like hate it? and then just enjoy my free time to like do my hobbies, like go hiking, like maybe make short movies for fun without any real pressure of like success. Or do I like really go balls to the wall and like make, try and make this happen, but kind of scrape along, earning little bits of money here and there to keep it going, but then feeling frustrated that I'm not getting the results I want. Three, two, one, jump. My dad lived in Phoenix, so we went hiking around there. And then we had a trip to southern Utah that really got me interested in like hiking. I was just sick of bartending at this place I'd been at for a few years and didn't want to go down the path of like my coworkers who were, they all like boozed a lot and they're still doing drugs when they were like in their 30s. I was like, I don't want to be that person. So I was like, oh, I'm just going to go hike the AT. It was, I think I'd seen Bill Bryson's book in like high school and had like said it to my friend like, this is so cool, we should do this. But like, she's like married, she's never gonna do it. So I was like, well, all right, I'll go do it. <laughs> like I've had a, like the coworkers before like who had kids when they're 19 and they're giving me shit like, oh, you're so spoiled. I'm like, actually, I make a lot of sacrifices. I live in a truck. I lived in a truck over the winter. It was cold, it was horrible. Like, it's, I don't know. I think there's like a balance between like, <laughs> we are super lucky to be able to do what we do and need to appreciate that. But I think a lot of other people don't realize these sacrifices that you make also. I also don't want to be involved in like the whole like, I don't know, like this is my pack. Like, look at all the gear I use, like shake me down. Like, I'm just like, I don't know. All that stuff doesn't interest me. I'm more just like, don't want to work and want to be outside for a long time, whether it's hiking or pack rafting or bike packing, yeah, so. So I've been living out of my truck for like a year and a half now, and then I've been in it ever since, except for the times that I'm in my tent, um, or the nights that it's so cold that I sleep on my friend's floors. I have managed to fit like seven or eight different hobbies in the back of that truck. I feel like this lifestyle is like really stupid sometimes in like I live in my truck in the winter in Salt Lake and was sleeping on the floor of a ski locker or in my truck and freezing in like Walmart parking lots. And I was like, why am I doing this? This is so stupid. I could just pay for an apartment and like not go on as many trips. I bounce around a lot. So it's like signing a lease is never really going to work well for me. I don't want to sign a lease in Jackson. That's like probably my biggest nightmare, actually. Like, I told work I was gonna go back to Jackson, and the more I've been out here, the more I'm like, I can't do it. <laughs> so the avalanche shoot on the KCHBR was at the end of Arrow Basin. And Skirger kind of described it as like, oh, if you're coming from Road's End, which most hikers aren't, he was like, yeah, it's probably like doable. So I was like, okay, I'm sure it's not that bad. We're going down it. That can't be, can't theoretically, it can't be that bad, but it was. It was very, steep at the top and so we kind of like staggered ourselves so it wouldn't be too like dangerous with like rocks falling. Then it started like cliffing out um, and it was like these like slabby super slick cliffs that you kind of had to like go around. 
you don't even know if you're going down the right chute because on the map, it's just like a tiny imperceptible squiggle. And it starts like way below where his dot is. And then we were like way up high. And I was like, is this even the right freaking chute? I don't know. Um, you can't see the cliffs because they're too small. You just, you have no information. And then it was just fucking horrible. <laughs> That just went on for so long that I was just like, this is getting to be too much, and just kind of like shrieked and cheesy thought I fell like off a cliff. Dropped 1,800 feet and three quarters of a mile, cliffed out twice. We literally like finished out going through a tunnel. It was like Alice in Wonderland going through like the rabbit tunnel. It's just a tunnel of trees and roots and dirt, and all you're inhaling is just rotting leaves and dust and just skirting down that for probably like 75 plus feet. It was horrible. We had to jump down like a 20 foot, no, not 20 foot, that's an exaggeration. It was like 12 to 15 foot cliff because we couldn't figure out a way around it. And the sun was setting. I would just want to know how he even conceived going up that avalanche chute. Like, were there Google Earth images that were used? Like satellite photos? Like, how do you look at a topo map and see that shoot and be like, yup, that's what I'm gonna try. Like, it's the top of, it's a cliff. It is literally a cliff. You go down a cliff, it's bullshit. <laughs> yeah, I mean, when you're picking off trail routes, um, uh, there isn't always a great way to go. Um, when I, in putting together the Yosemite High Route for the last year, there's actually one pass that I call, I call it Lemonade Pass because when you're given lemons, you make lemonade. <laughs> and there's like this pass, it's terrible. It's terrible on both sides. Um, but it is the only way to get from this particular drainage into the next one. Um, so, you know, it's the, it's un, I f always feel bad as the guidebook author sort of sending people over this. Um, but hopefully if I do my job right, I sort of qualify it enough and, you know, basically say to the effect of like, well, this section is really gonna suck. So just sort of be prepared. Um, and I know that, um, uh, there are there's some places in the guidebooks that aren't described perfectly well and people get maybe a little off route or maybe I don't quite do it justice in my descriptions and I'm sure that my name gets cursed a few times out there. Uh, I even have a photo from, uh, I had a couple of clients who did, a, did an alumni trip and they made it to the top of uh, Copper Mine Pass. And and uh, let's see, I guess it's, it's the, the pitch out of Cloud Canyon is like kind of a little dicey. It's like you're on those loose, uh, craggy uh, slopes and like the they dynamited a little trail into the rock and and there's this photo of them at the the top and they're all giving me the bird <laughs> and these are like clients of mine these guys actually like me so someone who's never met me I'm sure that like I'm sure they're like wow he's just a total like masochist yeah. I thought you said they were cotton. Oh, these are synthetic as fuck. That's why I like them so right, much. Yeah, they're stretchy. <laughs> synthetic as fuck. <laughs> I was freaking out. It was like really swollen, like really hurt. Like there's a couple of spots that just like consistently hurt in it. And I was taking like, I think like nine Advil a day. I don't think being out here is really making it get that much better. <laughs> like, it's still swollen right now. It still hurts, like, every day, realistically. Um, but it could be worse, I guess. I don't know. When you're, like, really suffering that pain and, yeah, you've taken a bunch of Advil, like, why do you keep going through the pain? Or, like, what makes you keep going through the pain? I have no idea. I think it's partially that I like am reckless and not really considering the fact that I'm almost certainly going to get arthritis uh, because of this. But um, I gave up a lot this year uh, because of the accident, like trip wise and like photo opportunity wise. And I think when things are really bad, I have a tendency to just kind of ignore it.
I like going first because I don't have time to like think and get scared. But with like Copper Mine Pass being the last person, I get scared as shit. Like I started panicking and was like, oh my God, we're gonna die here. This is all wrong. I felt like I put my life in danger on that avalanche chute and coming up and over Copper Mine Pass because we had no guide on where the actual pass was. And coming from our side, it's really hard to tell. But we ended up skirting around on these really loose scree fields that one misstep or if you were to fall, you're falling like 800, 900 feet without stopping. And we couldn't figure out any other way but just to go for it, roll the dice again. And thankfully we found the trail, but it was definitely like take a deep breath and just do it type of thing. Do you think it's um, a big part of that route was maybe just to uh, see how hard you can make it and how much of a sucker fest it can be? Maybe, I don't know. I haven't done another Skirka route. I mean, dude's hardcore. So maybe it's just like a suffer fest, like see how many other people you can trick into your suffer fest. I don't know. Maybe he's like this like sadist who's just like waiting for Instagram photos of like KCHBR and he's like, <laughs> it's like, see how they do. See how those legs hold up. Standard shrimp shrimp's good. Yeah. A lot of people hate on it. But creamy chicken just like if it's done right, like fuck. Because if you put in just if the right it's amount done of water, right. <laughs> well if there's too just like the cream. <laughs> <laughs> well no, because like if you put too much water it loses the creaminess, but if you put in just mm, the right amount okay. of water, it's like a sauce. That's fair, that's mm. fair. This is, uh, uh, no joke. Ow! Ow! Face I'm like putting in the sounds I'm making right now. This is the final day of the Casey HBR. And it's kicked my ass. That's fine. But this knee pain and this foot pain, I can't fucking handle. The downhill has been about two and a half thousand feet, or probably now it's only about 1,500, with about a thousand left to go. I told the guys to go on ahead, that's fine. There's a pretty decent trail to follow here, but I just can't go very fast. <laughs> I don't really know what to do. I don't know whether to call it here at Lodgepole. But when I'm going downhill for more than a few minutes, this is what happens. And sometimes it's unbearably bad. And I can't, I can't do anything but just scream out in pain. Ah. I don't know what to do. A couple of hours later, we arrived at the Lodgepole Visitor Center, our first real sign of other people for five days. We bought food for the next section and sat outside the restaurant eating burgers because we smelt so bad. Other park visitors were staring at us, clearly wondering what we were doing. We set up our tents nearby and headed out the next morning. My knee and foot were killing me, but fortunately we were starting the High Sierra Trail, which would be much easier hiking and give me some time to recover. The High Sierra Trail is a 49 mile long, fully maintained trail in Sequoia National Park. The High Sierra Trail and the John Muir Trail are the well-known established trails, and the majority of the hiking in the Sierra is concentrated in these two areas. Some of the cross-country routes connect up with these two trails for brief periods when staying high up on the crest of the Sierra becomes too difficult. Going from what we experienced on the KCHBR going onto the High Sierra Trail. It was. That feel like what was it like? It was magical. Elevation gains are not 5,000 foot climbs as a standard. It's more like a thousand maybe, 
The High Sierra Trail was great because it was so easy and just pure trail, like we could like completely relax. That I was just kind of pumped to like have cruiser trail, do a 25 mile day. And we were done at like 4.30, five probably. I even had time to catch a couple golden trouts, but on the KCHBR, we were doing like 12 miles and it would take us from like leaving 6.30, 7 in the morning and finishing at like 7.30, 8 o'clock at night and doing 12 miles. If that gives you any type of like insight to how difficult that terrain was. At the same time, like KCH Barrow was nice because we didn't see people. And like, I like to get out here and like get out where nobody is. But you know, there were lots and lots of people. For some people, they, they equate a wilderness experience with being an experience where they don't run into people at all. And the Sierra offers many, many places where you can get really remote and not really see anybody for days on end. Uh, for other people, there's a social aspect to it where they enjoy running into people on trails and having conversations and stuff. And there are definitely trails on the Sierra that are more popular where you can get that. I think one of the bigger challenges that the High Sierra will see is a concentration of backcountry traffic. And you're already seeing that with something like a five or six fold increase in John Deere Trail traffic in just in the last 10 years or so. And there's just like dramatic growth. Um, and I think a lot of it has to do with just the social media amplifier. John goes, does the John Deere Trail, comes home, puts it up on Facebook or Instagram and says like, wow, this is the most beautiful trail I've ever done. And Susie sees that and Bill sees that and they're like, wow, I want to do the John Muir Trail. And there's just tons and tons of people there. There's established campsites. You're rarely going to get a campsite to yourself. Uh, you're rarely going to hike, you know, more than, and, you know, 30 minutes without bumping into someone. I mean, obviously that has problems with, you know, closed lakes, impacted campgrounds, more bear problems huge permit issues, all the stuff that goes with concentrating everybody on the known social media desirable trail. On one hand, it's, um, it's concentrated a lot of traffic. Um, and on the other hand, I just feel like it's like all the other pockets of the park <laughs> are like, no one's in them. I think people go to the JMT because they think it's gonna be like, go and discover yourself and like be super introspective and like be in the wilderness and like not see people. But then you get out there and like, it's just nonstop people. It's hard to pee. It's hard to pee without somebody coming around the corner. I think it's awesome that those people are going out there and seeing the amazing things there are to see. Like the JMT is like some of the best stuff we've seen out here. I would like to kind of give them a shakedown and be like, hey, like you could be doing this, but you could do it like way more comfortably by doing this and this. But it's not my place telling the person like how they should be doing stuff. And I think that can be a problem in like the long distance hiking community that there is this ego oftentimes, like your pack needs to be this certain size or this certain weight. And if it's not, then you're like doing it wrong. Kind of looking down on people that are beginners, which is totally unfair because everyone was a beginner at some point. We all have to learn from our experiences and I respect people for just going out and having adventures. It doesn't matter where it is, how it is, and how much weight you're carrying on your back. The main thing is just go out and like do it. So it's also really awesome and encouraging that like, despite there being like super busy areas that you can still get out into like truly isolated spots in these like, magnificent areas that everybody wants to go. If you know how to find it and know how to look for it, you can kind of get out there like on the routes that we're doing and be totally alone. You can go days without seeing people. I mean, the amazing thing about the Sierras is that people really don't go off trail there. You, know, you could be a half a mile off the JMT and you might as well be in the middle of nowhere. You can have your own lake hell. You can have your own basin to yourself and walk around naked for days and not expect to see anybody.
With the relatively easy terrain on the High Sierra Trail, we were able to cover the distance in just over two days. Then it was back into town to resupply on food before heading back out for our next cross-country route, the Southern Sierra High Route. The Southern Sierra High Route, it's 100 miles, 60 miles of it or more off trail. If you compare Southern Sierra High Route from the parallel portion of the John Muir Trail, there's no comparison between the two. The Southern Sierra High Route over that section is just significantly higher and more rugged than the John Muir Trail. It has 14 passes over 11,000 feet versus just four for the JMT. And it crosses the Sierra Crest eight times versus the, the John Muir Trail single crossing. I don't think you go below 10,000 feet for the, the entire route. And you pretty much have, have the Sierras to yourself as far as you're concerned. I've done the Roper Sierra High Route. I think it came out in 76. And by the time it came out, I'd already done um, large portions of the northern part of it since that was my stomping grounds out of the San Francisco Bay Area. And then through the 70s and early 80s, um, you know, did the southern portions of it. One of the things the Roper was trying to do was make these higher Sierras accessible to more people. Now, I think that was one of the brilliant ideas of the Sierra High Route was just like, get off the trails, get out there and, and, and explore the, you know, 99.99% of the Sierras that's not on trail. We basically work in CalTOPO or an online mapping program and we are you know, working collaboratively online on trying to figure our best guess of where this thing is going. You know, we're running a, a high quality GPS track, which we may not give to the end user. It may be a series of points. We try and give people enough information to keep them out of trouble and keep them in the general direction. But we try and leave the sort of route finding and, and some of the challenge up to the reader so they can have the experience of, of doing that themselves. An average, reasonably fit backpacker should be able to do the route. Our goal was to create a route that people could do, that people would do. There's always some, some level of unknown. You just put your pack on and you go and you, know, you bring your A game. It started getting windier and then there was a bunch of like weather that blew in over Bishop Pass, but it was like super cold after that. Still pretty windy. Um, and it was just like that one storm kind of blew the colder September weather in. From the first day that we started until now, we've dealt with like different challenges consistently. Like we'll deal with one challenge for like three or four days and then that one seems to have died down. Like the mosquitoes were really bad at first and then that's gone away. And now we're dealing with cold weather, but now we're gonna maybe deal with like precipitation, like rain and snow. And then some days we've dealt with like extreme sunshine where you like, you're really worried about burning yourself and we've all got kind of burn. It's just a harsh environment. Starting out on the Southern Sierra High Route is where things for me like start to feel a lot better. Super beautiful, hard but like rewarding. So you would go through something that was like very steep climb or difficult talus, with maybe some exposure and a little bit of like fear in there, but then you'd be rewarded. And my mental state has been a lot better. There's definitely been points on this where I've been like, why am I out here? Like this is way more intense and way more challenging than I expected. I guess it's that kind of like type two fun. Like in the moment, it might not necessarily be fun, for the next day or the next week, you look back and be like, wow, that was really cool. Like, I'm really glad that I went and did that. Historically, many of these areas were completely covered in snow, even in the middle of summer. 
but now they were just endless talus fields. Hiking through them was brutal on the body. These big, loose rocks would roll out from underneath you whenever you stepped on them. I was still dealing with pretty bad knee pain, but then I'd look over and Sonic would just be crushing uphill. I knew she must be struggling with her ankle, and sometimes you could see it on her face, but she wouldn't say anything and would just keep pushing forward. It takes a while for the talus to settle and interlock and shift and, and move until it's in a stable configuration. Um, and that's not gonna happen in 10 or 20 years of it lacking snow. And you end up going down and you know, like your own raft of scree for like 10 or 15 feet, you know, and stopping calf deep in it if you've ever experienced that. I've caught a lot of variety, which is cool. I caught a good sized rainbow, caught a couple brookies, like nine brookies, something like that. And then I've caught about four goldens, which is the whole reason I want to come out here is to fish for golden trout because they're native to this area. They evolved here and they're like the most brilliant fish ever. They're beautiful. One of the best moments of fishing out here so far is I like was out there fishing and like wasn't catching anything and just switching out my fly. I, I switched out a fly to something that I thought might work better. Then all of a sudden I started getting strikes. And like, I thought that was just like really satisfying that like they, I fooled them into thinking that it was a true thing and then being like, oh, the mosquitoes aren't here anymore. So I fucking love it. Life like really like slows down. That's like why I think I love it is the lifestyle. Plus also I have like some abstract goals. First it was the triple crown. Now like the goal has been to do 10,000 miles before I turn 30, um, but I don't, that's not gonna happen. I think this is gonna be my last trail for probably a long time. Why is that? Cause I'm gonna start pursuing the culinary thing harder. I'm gonna focus on pushing that as far as I can. So this will probably be the last time I hike for a couple years. Probably, probably like, probably the next five to 10 years, I probably won't do another big hike. I'm applying to my dream job, a little bread bakery that I've been obsessing over. Because like, you know, I've just been hiking and I've been working jobs to hike, but I have no direction in like what I wanted to do professionally. And I had no like kind of end game, you know, I've just been kind of floating. And now I feel like I have like a direction as far as like what I want to do professionally. Because like, you know, of course, I like I really want to do the photography thing, but like realistically, that's not going to happen. You know, there's so many photographers out there and like I'll always do it and like maybe make money on the side from it. But like I'm not going to be Chris Burkhard. I'm not Jimmy Chin. Like I'm not. It's just not going to happen, you know. And I think you're like. I just felt like this was something that made me happy. And like, yeah, I feel like I'm pretty good at it. Make me all nervous. That weather pattern was insane. I've never watched clouds form like that, just like rolling up the the valley like that and just like clinging to the mountains. It was pretty special. The light is always changing in the Sierras. And there's a rhythm of light to the Sierras and a way the light looks in the Sierras that it looks nowhere else in the world. 
I think it's one of the things I like about being a photographer is that um, I'm really aware of that. One of my goals is to try and capture that experience or at least try and communicate it in some way. And I, I, I think that, that photography and, and probably video at this point, um, if done well, can begin to give some people a glimmer of what, what it's like to experience the, the light in the Sierra. You wake up and you're, you know, on the eastern side of the Sierra and you see, you know, Mount Whitney glowing orange in the dawn. It's, it's, it's one of those just deeply spiritual experiences that I, I, mean, I guess you have to, have to be there, but it, I think anybody that's been in the Sierra is probably understands, you know, sort of what John Muir meant when he said they are the range of light. If you go and do the JMT and your goal is to get a few selfies and you're hanging out with a bunch of folks, you may never have that experience. Not that you have to, not that that's a, a requirement. Great number of ways to enjoy the Sierras. But I think what John Muir was talking about is this transformative effect of this range of light if you want to be part of it. You can be part of it. It's not just. You're not just simply an observer. If you're there and you're present, you can be part of it. When you're off trail, you're high and challenging terrain, and you know every step kind of matters sometimes. You are very present. Um, and there is that loss of ego and this, this sort of merging with the landscape where the, the cumulative effect of that and then the light in the Sierra sort of combines synergistically to sort of launch you into a, a very much a, a space of belonging. You aren't following an established trail. The navigation's not easy. It's remote. They tend to be very sort of stark and austere at times. But for me, it's a far more spiritual experience. Take a little sip of water and then yep. We do some at Mount Whitney, but we do it from a more interesting angle. We actually go up the, the Mountaineers route, so a, a much more elegant um, off-trail route up to the top of Whitney. Fucking cold. So the Southern Sierra High Route was pretty ideal, I think. It was pretty awesome. A lot of it was kind of like old trails that like no longer are used, you know, like old JMT sections that like got rerouted. If you are doing cross country stuff and you're trying to find these certain points that aren't like exactly routed out, you know, like a trail straight up to it. But it like if you saw something that looked impassable, there was actually a description of like, this is exactly how to get over it. 
this is what to look for, which I, I think is pretty ideal. It did use a good chunk of the JMT, which at the time I guess I was relieved because then you get to like kind of like crush out miles, but I guess it would have been nice to like be off of that a bit more. But I also understand because it's just such a, like a main vein of the Sierras and it hits so much good stuff. Some of the stuff we saw was pretty spectacular. And not, we didn't run into too many people aside from like on the JMT proper. So you definitely got that feeling of isolation out there. The Sierra High Route, or Roper's High Route, is the original cross-country route in the Sierra. It was developed by noted climber and historian Steve Roper in the 1970s. It is 195 miles long, around two-thirds of the route is off-trail hiking, and the rest is on the John Muir Trail. A rugged hike, similar to the other two cross-country routes, the hard work pays off, and this is a classic American hike for a reason. I think they saw Josh this morning. Huh? I think they all saw Josh this morning. <sighs> they were like, did you see that guy running? It's like, oh, that sounds familiar. <laughs> Lost my lens cap. Oh, you did lose it? Yeah. Shit. I went back real far. I just bashed my camera and I was checking to see if it... Oh, uh, okay. ...was all right. Which thankfully it is. Okay. The Sierra High Route so far has been incredible. It's like the most established, it's kind of like the most well known of like the routes that we're doing. It's kind of been a shame that the weather's been a bit colder and like not so nice because I feel like we've maybe gone through it a little bit quicker than we maybe would have otherwise. The Bear Lake area that we went through like a couple of days ago, it was just like amazing. And I could have happily spent a day in that entire basin, you know, just, just, just camping out and just like taking it all in. In the middle of the Bear Lakes Basin, we came across Eric, a solo hiker heading the same direction as us on the Sierra High Route. He seemed happy to see other hikers and his good sense of humour was pretty infectious. It was immediately clear that he would be joining us for the rest of the trip. I <laughs> my... <laughs> Modelling the super feet. These smell so bad. <laughs> The Sierra High Route has been so cool. It's high effort a lot of the time, but I think it like maximizes the reward as well. Incidentally, the Sierra High Route goes through our favorite places from the other routes. So I think that says a lot about it already. Um, but also like Roper just like knows his shit. He spent a lot of time in the Sierra. Like this book is obviously very well like put together and like the route itself is well put together. I'd say it's like actually like rather remote. And like the only times we really saw people 
we're on the JMT, which is pretty cool. You don't get that like very often, certainly not on like the normal like Triple Crown trails. I wouldn't mind doing it again because um, it's just like it's so scenic and I wouldn't mind doing it in like August and not being freezing. With like six days or so left, I guess, of course, the thoughts are already a little bit on like going home and seeing Michelle and kind of just living like normal life again. But I'm excited to like finish this up, like enjoy it and then kind of just like tick that box and say, cool, like it's, it's done. I did that. Like, and I can be proud of that for sure. Super proud of this trip. So I have to get off early from the route because I have to go deal with some like Finnish bureaucracy. I have to get back into the country before my residence permit expires. So yeah, I'm missing the last like six days, I think, of the trail. Of course, I'm like a little bummed that I have to finish early, but at the same time, it's kind of nice to be done. When I think of you guys like going into like snow and stuff, like it's pretty relieving to know that I'm like gonna be chilling in LA, I'm, like going to the aquarium, drinking pumpkin spice lattes. Like it's gonna be okay. How does it feel to actually be going home, though? Does it feel good? Yeah, it does. Yeah, I'm actually really excited to go back to Finland. Like, I'm excited to see Erica. Will I come back to the Sierras? I don't know. Maybe. I'm, I'm, life is pretty long. I don't know. I have, like, such conflicting, like, feelings about the Sierra. They're a little too, like, barren for me. This stretch, the Sierra High Route, Roper Sierra High Route, really kind of, like, was the best that I've ever seen in the Sierras. The main draw for me this time to come here, like the original inspiration was the golden trout. I had a lot of fun fishing. I caught probably like close to 40 fish. Damn, that's <laughs> ridiculous. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Like I'll always incorporate it into my backpacking trips probably if I can, if it's an area that can be fished. But yeah, I, I, I don't think I'll be back in the Sierras for a while. On the Sierra higher out, it's just been like way, way, way colder. More precipitation, like a wintry mix yesterday like that perfect temperature to like kind of get you like soaked during the day and then like not have enough layers when you get to bed uh, at night and it drops into the teens. We hiked up to Superior Lake, I think it was. And we were like kind of like hurrying all day. It was like seven miles, but it felt like, I don't know, like 20, because you could just see these clouds blowing in that were super dark and menacing. And we were definitely expecting snow. I was ahead and picked like a really like kind of like ideal sheltered spot. But then Eric checked his inrage and was like, oh, there's not going to be any snow. And I like, I still was ready for snow. I was like, I'm getting my shit like under my vestibule, everything else in the tent, batteries in my pockets, like ready to go. I don't know what time it was started, but it was just like pounding, like grapple. I forgot what the definition was now, where it kind of like condenses on the ground or something. It's just like little tiny balls that aren't quite hill or slate. It's definitely like snow. We woke up to a pretty decent layer of that. It was like all night, like that banging on Cuban fiber. <laughs> I love the smile and the positive attitude. <laughs> I know it's trying to mask something. <laughs> and the next morning we had to climb Nancy Pass and it was just a bunch of like crappy talus on the other side and going up a little bit. I was just covered in snow though, so we just kept falling and eating it on the rocks and Eric really took a hard fall. So we decided to try and get to Minaret Lake around lunch to try and dry our stuff out. And as we're there, more just like ominous clouds start rolling in and we could see like how tall they were. We're like, oh man, those are like, those are real clouds. Um, and then it started snowing and we just kind of like stood around the snow for a while like, oh, are we gonna go back to town? There's like this trail, the Minaret Lakes Trail that goes right back where we started. Don't know why we Roper didn't have us to take that to begin with, but it's a great bailout option. So um, yeah, we decided to do it. Um, you know, like Eric said, the, uh, when the going gets hard, the hard go get dominoes. <laughs> Hi, 
At that point on the trip, we were just completely exhausted. Um, all of our gear was soaking wet. We knew we were going to be dealing with more snow and below freezing temperatures and more slippery talus fields. Um, I don't know if we were in like legit risk of hypothermia, but the sound of a pizza and a warm motel room was enough for us to hike back to the road and hitchhike into town. Um, that evening, yeah, the pizza was great and the hot shower was great, but I fell asleep feeling, feeling like we'd given up. And then the next morning, we checked the weather forecast and there was going to be more bad weather. So we decided to hitchhike forward along the route and continue on from Ptolemy Meadows. Uh, by doing that, we would then avoid the worst of the weather. Do you feel like you're quitting? And then also like, um, can you talk about like, was it really the conditions in that moment that made us like take yeah. that trail? You know? Yeah. Um, it definitely felt like quitting to me. Like when we all discussed it, I kind of thought like, yeah, if we get off trail now, I'm not going to get back on it too all me. Um, I'm happy that we did and we're finishing this section. Um, but I was super bummed because realistically looking at my record, like I haven't finished quite a few things. And I think it's like once you get to that point where you allow yourself to quit, uh, it's easy to do again. And it's not, I don't think quitting is necessarily a bad thing. It's like, if you're not having fun, why are you there? But I think there's also something to be said for like setting out and accomplishing a goal. Um, One of the biggest things is I have never regretted making a conservative decision with clients or personally. Like that, that stuff, it's going to stay there. It's, I can come back to it. Um, but uh, it's always better to back down off something or maybe take the lower route rather than take the risk. And sometimes the risk pays off wonderfully. And it's like the best decision you ever made. But I've also been burned many times by thinking that my groups or that I was capable of doing a little bit more than I should have been doing. I think we made the right call, um, but it still sucks. The Sierra High Route was the one trail going into this I really wanted to do. And it's the one that we now don't get to do the whole thing. Was it really the conditions that moment that made us turn around then? Um, hmm. I think at that moment when it we were trying to dry our stuff and it started snowing and those clouds look awful. Just knowing what was coming up, like I knew it was going to be a really hard day based on my trip reports and like, I don't want to do that. I'm tired. I have a busted ankle. And just being out here above 10,000 feet doing these steep mountain passes like over and over and over again after like that many days on trail, it's kind of like, honestly, we've like kind of accomplished most of the goal. Like we've been in the high Sierra for like over a month, like, I'm tired. Something that this trip has definitely done is kind of like pushed my boundaries. I'm a lot more confident now than I was at the beginning of this trip in terms of just like exposure and following a route, not just following like a trail, navigating talus, navigating snow, and like looking at a situation, not having information on it, and then tackling it with the best approach. Coming out into the Sierras this year, like I wasn't planning on doing it earlier in the year, but then made the decision to come out to hike five weeks, which didn't sound like a long time at the time shoot the movie, push my boundaries and do more challenging like routes and more kind of like extreme stuff. And I think that's, I think that's totally happened. Um, I think I underestimated it in all, in all honesty. I, uh, it's been more challenging and more extreme than I thought it would be. But that's probably the reason that I had so many like doubts halfway through the trip or even earlier on in the trip. But I'm so glad that I like stuck it out and I'm gonna see it through to the end despite like some pretty bad knee pain, despite some very cold temperatures at the moment. Um, yeah, I, I mean I think I will like have achieved what I wanted to achieve. It's not been as like clean as you always picture things in your head, but it's been it's been pretty real. 
I could see myself in like 30 years maybe coming back and doing the JMT because it is really beautiful. Uh, maybe come back with Michelle or some friends and just take it pretty easy. Maybe I'll be the one doing like 10 miles a day, but definitely not with a heavy backpack. Aside from the JMT, I don't think I'll be back in the Sierras. They're cool, but they do have that kind of gloomy, foreboding feeling hanging over me. And there's a lot of other places I want to see and a lot of other things I want to do. I think when I started the trip, my idea was like, I want to do all the routes now so I never have to come back to California again. Um, <laughs> I don't quite have that opinion anymore. Did you get what you wanted from the Sierra trip? From the series of routes and from the Sierra as a whole, did you get what you wanted? Mm, I don't really know what I wanted, so I don't know how to answer that. I mean, I guess I can say no, honestly. Like, we didn't do the entire Sierra high route. Just the fact that we had to miss that other section now just makes it like that much more like obvious that I need to come back. But whatever it was that I wanted to accomplish, I don't know if I quite feel like I got it, like I need to come back and do more, I guess. <laughs>